Okay, welcome back. There were some conversations going on, but not enough. So um, I've got other spies out for the lunchtime break to observe what conversations are taking from the money talk cards. So just a reminder, please keep using Slido. The stats that Anna gave me at 9.22, we were halfway there, so she will give us an update, but please, um, I encourage you to get those questions coming through. Now, we've got a, another fantastic session to happen right now about bridging the gap, and um, a number of you will have seen Tracy and Anna talk, refer to a conversation that's already been had with a panel discussion, and we've got an equally as good panel coming up very, very shortly. Um, so again, you know, use Slido. But um, before I introduce the panel, and the panel today is uh, Pushpa, um, Hugh, Hugh Stevens, uh, Nick Summerfield, Sarah Whitelock, and Christina Leong um, are going to come up and have a chat with Francis. But what we're going to do now is we're going to play you a quick video and then we're going to hear from Jane Wrightson who's going to frame the session that the panel are going to have and then I will ask the panel and uh, Francis to come up. So over to the video. tend to take time off when the babies arrive um, and also women tend to earn less money than men which means we will have less disposable income available that can be saved up for retirement and also women tend to live longer than men um, which means we'll need more retirement funding future. You don't get a pay rise the year that you are on maternity leave and then when you come back because you haven't been there for a year you don't get a pay rise again so I found that there were two years in a row where you miss out on a pay rise even though you may have only been out of the workforce for a year. You're constantly putting your family ahead of things, you, you're, upon, uh, you're putting you know managing the household ahead of everything else and by the time you're done with all that you're exhausted and mentally you just don't have the capacity to think about anything outside of you know, household management and let alone having to learn about investments and things like that and you really need to dedicate time for that. You pick up magazines, you pick up brochures, you look at advertisements, what are you going to see likelihood is men you know making investment decisions and stuff like that so it does create those biases in your head it reinforces those beliefs that it is a man's world and it's a man's job therefore and they're better at it personally I'm very financial financially independent and I love it that way you know that I'm not dependent on anyone else whatever I want to do wherever I want to go so it does worry me that I haven't saved much towards retirement at this stage because then I'm thinking would I be <laughs> dependent you know and the thought of being dependent on my kids doesn't feel good. Thank you. Um, please now join me in welcoming Jane Wrights and our Retirement Commissioner. I'm Jane Wrights and I'm the Retirement Commissioner. Um, Te Ara Ahunga Ora, the Retirement Commission, is focused on the long journey to retirement, uh, although it gets closer every year, I'm noticing, um, and how people can secure their economic well-being uh, over time. And as you know, financial well-being takes perseverance, determination, and quite a lot of luck. You're lucky if you're born into a comfortable family. You have, you have education and brains, not necessarily the same thing. You don't divorce messily. You don't lose a business or your home. And you keep your health. And probably if you're a man. The fact remains, almost all women are materially worse off financially than their male counterparts. And the wealth gap directly affects life and retirement. Every single piece of research from every single entity confirms this. The National Strategy for Financial Capability, which we at Te Ara Ahunga Ora uh, produced after months of sector consultation, 
is an attempt to bring together the financial capability sector to focus on working collectively to help New Zealanders understand money. There are three very simple goals. I only like strategies on one page. It makes it nice and simple. So the three goals are consistent content so the audience isn't confused, work together so the sector doesn't duplicate and we maximise focus and impact, and demystify money so we know why knowledge of debt, saving and investing is important uh, and making good decisions around money and reaching goals. How hard can it be? As one of the three priority audiences for the strategy, women are the first year's focus um, of the NatStrat projects seeking to get the sector working together. It starts with action, it has been a powerful three months where with pretty limited resources, the FSC team, women in super, and volunteers from across the sector have pulled together an amazing range of activities. So bravo, I congratulate you all. When I charged the FSC with this project, and Richard and his board gallantly accepted the challenge, then gave the work to the woman, RIS, and women in super, <laughs> clever, eh? My hope was that it would provide an opportunity to put a significant woman-focused project at centre stage, moving from talking to action, in other words. That is the challenge now for this summit. What will be the concrete actions the sector as a whole will take to address women's financial capability in the long term? You already know there's huge support for this. Look at this room. Who will drive this? Who will draw up a plan, get it agreed, and start to achieve targets? Which leaders are going to step up and commit time and resources and brain power to help? I love the declaration. Will it have multi-year goals and objectives? Please say yes. This next panel is talking about the gender retirement gap. I'm looking forward to hearing what an action plan to help address that gap might look like. The retirement gap is driven by factors that you all know. Lower personal incomes of women, fewer opportunities to build up assets and contribute to KiwiSaver, poorer access to relevant and engaging financial education, and an attitude towards money that sees women sometimes more conservative about their financial future, or simply putting family first. As a wicked problem, I know there's no simple solution. But I also know you can build a complicated house, one brick at a time, with vision and a plan. Thank you all so much for being here today and for your active support to the cause. I'm now going to ask the next panel to come to the stage, chaired by the um, fabulous Francis Cook. No reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. All right. I'm sure you all missed me. It's been so long. All right. I'm joined now by our fabulous panel, Christina Liang, Principal Economist at NZIER, Dr Pushpa Wood, Director of Massey University's FinEd Centre, Hugh Stevens, CEO of SmartShares, Nick Summerfield, partner at Anthony Harper, and Sarah Whitelock, consumer wealth leader at Mercer. This is a really important discussion, everyone, the gender retirement gap. I mean, we already know that it is far more likely that women will end up in poverty in what should be their golden years. But personally, I was surprised. I look at this stuff all the time, but I was surprised by the latest figure showing that the average woman's Kiwi saver is 20% lower than the average man's. And that's an average. That means in some cases it's far worse. In some cases it's $318,000 worse. That's huge. And frankly, it's not good enough. <laughs> So I'm going to start with that research. I'm going to have a chat to you, Christina. That 20% figure came from NZIER research that you put together for Kiwi Wealth. Tell me more about what we know about this Kiwi Saver gap. Yeah, so a lot of the uh, drivers of the gap have been well researched and 
we know from the literature, for example, that the drivers um, of that KiwiSaver gap stem from four key factors. So that being the fact, the difference between men and women in labour force participation, uh, pay equity between the difference between men and women, uh, career gaps, and often it is the woman that takes the career gap when it comes to, uh, for example, taking time out to uh, usually to look after children, but also uh, perhaps the elderly as well or any other family member. Uh, and then also that um, confidence, that difference in confidence and knowledge uh, that tends to have happened between men and women. Um, so these, of course, then draw, um, what happens is that it leads to differences, um, and again, usually it's between men and women, in terms of the contributions into KiwiSaver, but also the returns on those KiwiSaver balances. So when we think about um, different strategies, they are very much geared towards addressing those. How do we address that difference in contributions and also that difference potentially in returns on those KiwiSaver balances? Yeah, let's talk strategies because I'm so keen, you know, like you say, we've, we've seen research in this area before, but it's, it's turning it into action, right? So what strategies did you identify that could make a difference? And do you see any that have the potential to make a really big impact? Are they top strategies? Mm. So um, when it comes to addressing those four key factors, uh, it all, um, again, stems from, uh, for example, improving pay equity, uh, also continuing uh, contributions uh, for uh, those that are taking time out for parental leave. And again, that tends to be the woman, but it should be regardless of gender, whoever is taking time out, that they still have uh, contributions paid into their KiwiSaver account. Uh, also improving the financial capability and literacy of those participating in KiwiSaver to ensure that it's not so much about um, what, like we know from uh, the research that we did, we quantified the difference between uh, putting money into a uh, um, into a conservative versus a growth fund amounts to almost 300,000 at retirement age. So it's but it's not so much about like trying to um, get people to in. Uh, to invest in growth fund as such. It's just knowing that knowledge is power, knowing the difference, the consequences of their choices. And so that goes some way to leveling the playing field when it comes to investing. And of course, also the, um, the option, the potential for uh, universal carer payments uh, to be paid. And that's uh, to acknowledge the role that carers uh, contribute to society and ensuring that um, that they are uh, mitigating the impact on KiwiSaver balances. Yeah, I thought that that was a really interesting one where you, you know, you identified things that businesses could do and that government could do, which I think is really important. It is more than one area that's responsible. Um, and so the idea of those universal care payments um, that could come from government. Um, and there's also the idea that businesses could continue paying into their employees KiwiSaver while they're on leave. Have you had resistance to any of these ideas? So at the end of the day, it's all up to all of us to play a part in uh, reducing this uh, gender retirement gap. Um, and in terms of the strategies that we've put forward, um, as you say, it relates to organisations, uh, what organisations can do, uh, what the government can do, but also what us as individuals can do. So when it comes to organisations, for example, we talk about um, trans improving the transparency in the gender pay gap so that we know, uh, again, that goes back to contributions. Having a gender pay gap means that there'll be a difference in contributions between men and women, which then compounds over the years to retirement. So in terms of improving transparency, um, the organisations have a role to play in uh, firstly identifying, reporting and then working to uh, eliminate these gender pay gaps. Um, and where the government could come in is to introduce legislation to ensure this transparency. Now, where resistance can come in is that, for example, um, there may be some that don't believe there's a, um, an issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, there could potentially be compliance costs for uh, organisations in terms of having to identify and report, so increased reporting requirements. So that's where we're likely to see some of this resistance come in when it comes to uh, the improving the uh, pay equity. Um, when it comes to things such as uh, in, 
uh, continuing that contribution in uh, for those that are taking time off for parental leave. Um, again, that represents a cost for organisations, and that's pro probably more significant for small businesses. So where um, we can enable a smoother transition is potentially for government to provide some sort of subsidy so that as um, this uh, policy is phased in, that there's a smoother transition for particularly small businesses to enable uh, this to take place, having these contributions for their staff that are away on parental leave. Um, when it comes to um, that whole improving education, the financial capability of women, um, I have heard pushback about the, um, the fact that women don't need to be educated on how to invest. And I th the, what I would say to that is that it's not necessarily about educating women per se, it's about how we can improve the financial knowledge and capability of all individuals so that we are levelling the playing field and people know the choices that the um, consequences of the choices that they're making. Again, it's not about pushing um, savers into particular funds or saying that one fund is better than the other. It's knowing that um, for your circumstances, what are the implications of those choices down the track when it comes to at retirement um, age and how you may want to then select um, the investment that will best suit your circumstances given this improved knowledge. Mm. Yeah, I've got to say, I mean, I've, I've covered this issue a lot for Business Desk and in a lot of my work, I also I spend a lot of time online. So in terms of never read the comments, I unfortunately always read the comments. Um, and Dr. Pushpa, I mean, I, I know the feedback I always get from people is people say, oh, it might be a gender issue, but there's far more at play here. So um, you will have seen so much research on this. <laughs> is this a gender issue? Are other factors in play? What's the balance here? I guess uh, from my point of view, um, just before I answer your question, I came to this country in 1980. It's been 42 years, and I've been listening the same conversation for 42 years. There's a gender gap, there's a retirement income gap, there is this gap, and there's that gap. Right? What have we done in 42 years? Mm -hmm. We are still sitting here in 2022 saying the same thing that I heard in 1980. So whatever we are doing, we're not doing it right. Mm -hmm. Or we're not asking the right people to do what we need to do. Right? Are we thinking at this level and not really talking to the level that actually is going to be so-called beneficiary of this decision? Right. So when it comes to, it's not a gender issue, it is a societal issue, it's an attitudinal issue, it is a national issue, it is an international issue. Internationally we know the gap exists, but what are we doing about it? And that's where I guess if you hear frustration, because I am frustrated, because that really excuse my language, annoys the hell out of me, is when I keep hearing the same thing. What is the one guarantee all of you sitting here can give me today that in two years' time when I come back, we will not be talking the same thing? Mm -hmm. That when you go out of here, your let's start with action will actually show something concrete. Do we know do we actually know what is the issue that we are trying to actually resolve? Is it about knowledge? Is it about confidence? Is it about pay gap? What is, what is it that we're trying to address? One at a time, let's do it, right? And so, so to me, we had, I, I was doing some research as I was sitting there. Department of Maori Affairs was set up in 1947. Right? Ministry of Women was set up in 84. Ministry of Pacific Women set up in 1992. Right? TPK was set up in 1992. Um, yeah. uh, Pacific 90 and um, TPK 1992. We are still talking, these ministries and these specifically charged departments have been asked to address the issues. We are still today in 2022 asking about Maori women are disadvantaged, Pacific women are disadvantaged, and soon we will hear about ethnic women are disadvantaged because that ministry has also been set up. Right? So, so what, we, <coughs> what we need to be looking at is A, we need to change our discourse. 
We, it is not a problem, it is not an issue, it is a challenge. And the challenge we need to overcome, all of us, each individual needs to overcome. In my true solution style, here are some suggestions. All the employers need to do a financial resilience health check of your, all your employees, number one. Number two, identify where within your organization a gender pay gap exists and develop a strategy no longer than three years. What are you going to do about it? Don't give me 10 years, just give me three years. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to address it, right? Government needs to come on board. If we women haven't saved enough, right, government is going to have to pay us some form or some shape, right, in some way, some benefit somewhere. If Kiwi Saver is not enough or if government super is not enough, there are subsidies. So instead of waiting for when I turn 65, why don't you establish a baseline that when I go into motherhood role, there is a baseline that automatically goes into my Kiwi Saver. When I go into a caregiver role, it automatically goes into my Kiwi Saver. So instead of you waiting there, you start increasing my net worth from the time I take a break, right? Employ for shareholders, those who are sitting here, here's a challenge for you. For next five years, go without 20% of your profit margin. Establish a fund which is going to go towards addressing the gender pay gap. You're not going to be in streets with 20% less of your profit, believe me, right? 80% is still going to keep you afloat. But that 20% that you are going to put away from your profit margin is going to actually eliminate or at least help to eliminate some of the challenges that we're talking about. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh. I'm sorry if I come across harsh, but... I've got to tell you, it is refreshing yeah. and it is nice to hear someone publicly say the things I feel like you always have to be told you have to be nice you have to phrase it in a way you catch more flies with honey than vinegar mm. and it is annoying and it does make me angry sometimes and I do get annoyed at the talk fests you know it, it must be you know you've been working in this area for so long it must at times just feel like you're going in circles and everyone is pushing responsibility onto everyone else very much so you see I come from cultural background where Women are excellent savers, right? You cannot beat us in terms of saving. That's, that's, that's the reality of the situation. What we're not good at, and we've never been given opportunity, especially my generation, I'm very hopeful with the young generation that is sitting here. We have always been taught that investing is man's domain. You make sure that the, all the needs are being met, and there is money for your male partner to actually invest. But we haven't actively taken part in that, asking the questions. And our young generation, my daughter's generation, I'm very hopeful to say, no, I am taking charge of my own destiny. I do want to do that. We don't need OK, there is a certain amount of lack of knowledge among women about investing, but what is lacking more is their confidence in investing. Their self-confidence in investing, that's what we need to be working on. They can read, they can write, right? What is missing in the conversation so far is those who are not in the workforce. What are we doing about that? What is our action plan for those who are not in employment, but they are just as equally contributing to the society. Just as equally. And we need to think about that as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah, if anyone wants to give another round of applause, let's do it. I love it. I'm here for the passion. Anybody who is interested in action, please contact me afterwards. I'm all for actions. Perfect. Perfect.
And, you know, when I um, invited our panellists up here, I did joke about making poor old Hugh here punching bag. But it's true, we do need male champions on this as well. It cannot simply be women in the corner banging on about this. We do need allies and other people to take it up. So, you know, Hugh, when you are in these discussions, and sometimes it can be a bit delicate, I'm sure, you know, what sort of role do you think male champions can play in this area? Thank you, Francis. Yeah, uh, and apologies to everyone to have to listen to me again. It, uh, but uh, look, I, I, maybe just to be a bit of a counterpoint to Pushpa, I, I mean, one thing that we do know from research is that positive messages uh, uh, do have more impact, and particularly uh, amongst those uh, women who uh, are reticent or, or reluctant or are lacking in confidence uh, or haven't started to invest. So. Um, there is some, and you can find this research through the OECD paper that I keep referring to, um, but there's an organisation in uh, Behave uh, London who uh, do behavioural finance research, and particularly in the pension space in the UK. And what they did is, is looked at, um, for different types of investors, people who are actively saving for their future and people who aren't, what kind of messages cut through and which ones don't. And it turns out that actually, for people who are reluctant investors, um, trying to scare them, trying to frighten them, trying to push them, uh, is completely ineffective. We have to use language that is positive. Uh, we have to find stories of success and share those. So I suppose I, I'm also all for action, um, but I would say the action needs to be finding success stories, talking about what has worked over the last 40 years, uh, you know, we have had success. The gender pay gap has reduced, not enough, but it has reduced. Let's find those success stories and share them. And they need to be personal. You know, I think we've heard that on the stage today, that people, you know, want to share their personal stories and they cut through. They much, much, you know, they cut through more than dry research or, or numbers, you know, that people want to hear personal stories. So I think, you know, to round out my answer, I would say the role of men is to share success stories, um, you know, where uh, we've worked together, um, I suppose, in partnership with women, even our own success stories, it doesn't need to be a gender thing, and just say, what's worked for us? You know, and this can work for you too. So share positive success stories is my answer. Brilliant, I love that. And we've got a question that's come through Slido that I'm going to send your way, Nick, um, because I think it's a great one. How do we get more men to events like this? I will note we've got some men in the audience, but obviously it is slightly skewed. Um, how do we get more men to events like this? This will broaden our diversity and influence more of society as fathers, bosses, brothers, etc. Any ideas? Yeah, thanks for the impromptu question, first off. Uh, <laughs> welcome, welcome. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have an easy answer for that. I mean, the reality is that, for me, this is kind of outside of my comfort zone. You know, I'd be much more comfortable sitting up here talking about something like FAP licensing. No one would turn up, but, um, you know, I, I, w I would feel more at home on that. So, um, I guess, free tickets. <laughs> um, I think there's an element of, men recognising that it's an issue that affects men as well. Um, it's not specifically, or it's not really a gender issue. I mean, I, the risk of sounding like I'm, you know, kind of dismissing the issue. It, it affects men as well. We're, um, you know, we've all got mothers. Uh, we've got, most of us have got wives and partners. Many of us have got daughters. And it affects them, and therefore, by affecting them, it affects us as well. Um, and I guess if that doesn't work, I would cynically point out to the men in the room that if your wife has less money at retirement, you have less money at retirement. Um, and if you have to personalise it to make people or make men talk about the issue and recognise the issue, then, you know, go for it. Um, coming back to my scripted answer... <laughs> <laughs> the safe place. Uh, the, yeah, that's right, <laughs> safely behind the piece of paper. Um, you know, male champions do play an important role in it, right? Um, we have a slight degree of impartiality, I guess. We're, you know, arguably one step removed um, from it. And I think, if I reflect on what I do, then I think it's recognising, you know, a big part of the issue, of course, is, is women out of the workforce having kids. Um, and it's recognising that having kids isn't a pink job, it's a job for mums and dads. Um, and, you know, those of you who know me will know that I actually genuinely very, very firmly subscribe to that view. Um, 
And I work flexibly around my kids' schooling. I rocked up at 20 past nine or something this morning after taking my kids to school. Um, I work around their sports and, and the like. Um, and I think doing that, whilst having a full-time job that is really demanding at times, um, kind of sends a signal that there is a way forward for everyone. There's an element of sharing the load, um, but there's an element of not having to give up your career aspirations if, you know, if that's what you want from life just because you're a mum. Um, so yeah, an uh, element of walking the walk, I think, on that and recognising it's an issue for everyone. Absolutely, and I mean, work is central to this discussion because it's how many of us get our money in the first place in order to make these decisions, these financial decisions for our lives, and it can be what makes it really difficult to make the personal life, the family life work. So what do you think employers should be thinking about in order to help bridge this retirement gap? Yeah, great question. I mean, clearly there's a big role for employers. Um, I mentioned before equality, and I think it comes back to that, equal opportunities for women, equal pay for the same role. Um, I think most employers would probably genuinely think they already do that, but the data does say otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, employers have to keep focus on the issue. Um, there's an element of transparency in that, reporting um, on the gender pay gap, which is something our firm does, and being conscious of trying to close that. Um, the single largest factor that contributes to the gender retirement gap, or certainly as I understand it, is total amount of earnings over a lifetime. For women that's less because, um, you know, typically lower paying jobs and then time out of the workforce, um, caring for kids, having kids in part time work, I mean we all kind of know this. Um, I guess I would say one immediate step, and others have touched on it, is contributing to KiwiSaver whilst on parental leave. Um, I think any employer that is in a position to do it, and I know not all employers are, particularly smaller businesses, um, any employer that's in a position to do it should do it. I know that's something we're looking at. I'm looking at a CEO who's sitting in the corner. Um, and that would make a meaningful difference. But I know that's not the complete answer. It's not solely an issue for employers. But, um, you know, we certainly have a responsibility to at least do our bit. Mm, absolutely. Dr Pushpa, do you have further thoughts on that? I know you mentioned some things that employers could do previously. I mean, do you have further thoughts on this area? I think one of the things can be looked at that, yes, when women are on parental leave, they, they may not necessarily need to be full-time, 100% parent. If employer cannot afford to make the contribution, they can negotiate with the women to say, while you're on parental leave, will you be able to do, say, 20% or 25% of the work that you're doing? Is it possible? Is it practical? And therefore, in return for that, I will continue the, my contribution or employer contribution into your Kiwi Saver. Because the key thing is that gap that occurs and that puts them back so far behind is to try and bridge that gap between the government, the employer, and the employee, looking at how can we continue that contribution to the Kiwi Saver, where three parties are actually contributing to it. Or government comes on board and say, here's a baseline that is automatically going to be. I mean, I can talk about it because I'm not giving the money. Uh, so it's, <laughs> it's, easier, it's easier for me to, to, to say it. But uh, I'm also a great believer that if we do continue talking and if we do work in partnership, then the women will be just as keen to find a solution as the employer will be, given the opportunity. Same thing is in earlier um, uh, panel, it came up that women do not necessarily apply for higher paying positions or for promotions. Yes, that's very true. The area I work in education, you will see the, how many professors are male and how many professors are female, for example. But for that, if I have my way, I would say every woman or everybody is automatically opted in for promotion, unless they say, I don't want to be, all right? 
let's do the opt-in policy rather than opt-out policy. You, if, you have, if, you, if your employer thinks you can do the job, then you should be automatically considered instead of having to fill 35 pages to, to justify why you should be. All right, and because that's what puts a lot of people off. That's what puts me off. I've I've never applied for uh, going for a higher position. I can't be bothered filling out 35 <laughs> pages of it because if my my philosophy is if my employer still doesn't know me after 12 years, what I can and what I can't do, and I still have to write it and justify, hey, you know, I'm not interested. Uh, and that's what that's the that's the apathy that actually happens among even so-called highly educated professional women needs to be taken out, right? That apathy apathy needs to be actually drummed out of us, right? We need to be we need to be forthcoming and we need to be encouraged to be forthcoming. The conversation. I mean, who says you have to do 35 pages? Why can't you have a one-to-one -one or or a panel-to-one one three-hour or two-hour conversation to say we want to see whether you can hack it, right? And if you can hack it, go for it. Right? Let, let's start thinking outside the box rather than just still being bound up in in, in the traditions that has been coming for God knows how long. <laughs> It's so nice to hear someone as successful as yourself say that they can't be bothered. <laughs> because each, same. each year, every each year, I get asked the promotion round is coming up. Pushpa, you, you should put it in. Yes, I will consider it, and I consider it for five minutes. <laughs> I've never identified more. Oh, that's fabulous, um, Sarah. You recently launched the table. Mm. Tell me more about this platform, mm. and when you were conducting the research to help yeah. you set it up, what did you learn? Great, yeah, I'll, t I'll talk a bit of, first about what it is. Um, but going back <coughs> before that, Mercer Globally has done for a number of years a piece of research called When Women Thrive. And it actually started off labelled When Women Thrive, Business Thrives. And I think that's a really important link, and Rob, you raised it earlier. Mm. It's not just about fixing a problem for women. Mm. Actually, when we get it right, economies thrive, like the initial um, piece of research showed if you fixed pay parity for women, it improved countries' GDPs. In the US, I think it was a 5% improvement. In Japan, it was a 9% improvement. In Egypt, it would be a 34% improvement. Mm -hmm. So you don't just fix it for yourself um, or your sister or your daughter, but you fix it for things for um, a nation and for a community. And to your point, Nick, you know, if I get more in retirement, actually my husband gets a, a benefit as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been doing that for a number of years. We then also looked at the numbers, like we're all doing, that showed there's this massive gap between men and women. So we said, hey, we've got this amazing opportunity to take what we have developed and know at kind of a boardroom level and get it out onto the street to actually help everyday women, which was the genesis of the table. And the table is a virtual platform where we asked women to pull up a seat at the table and help them with their financial wellness. I'm going to start, um, I've already started, I'm going to now go to a comment that we've had some feedback from one of the women who has signed up. And she said, been having some big, in capitals, money comms, uh, convos with Josh, I'm assuming Josh is her partner, of late, and mate, it is good. Like legit feel super awesome about it. Yay for financial empowerment and yay for the table, which got me a bit braver. And for me, that's what it's actually all about. And to your point, we can sit around and talk or we can do some stuff that makes a difference and that's made a difference for that person. Um, in launching the table, we did lots of focus groups. We did co-design workshops and I sat in on one of those and what was really interesting is as an industry, we have so much knowledge and sometimes we're just actually worrying about the wrong things. And we're pitching stuff up here where the women were saying to us things like, I need practical, useful tips and information to build my wealth, to buy a house, to get financially lit. Mm. <laughs> mm. Um, I need stuff tailored to me. I need to feel valued as a customer, to feel welcomed. This is a big one. I need to not feel judged when I don't know the jargon. Mm. I sat in an investment committee meeting yesterday and I'm just sitting there going, oh, look, 
I live in this industry and I actually don't know what some of you guys are even talking about. Um, there was great excitement that there was an opportunity to take some of the mystery out of it. And you talked about that, Jane, the demystifying money. Um, so I think in short, to answer your question, you know, what do we need to do going forward? We need to make this stuff a bit cool and a bit sexy and a bit exciting. So women actually, who only I think have something like, Ange, correct me if I'm wrong, 10 minutes a day uh, spare, so it's got to be easy for them because like we've heard from most of the women here, you know, just getting here this morning was an effort. I've actually had to tell my husband what class one of our children is so he can <laughs> let them know he won't be at school today. He's been in that form class, you know, he's in year 12. He's in the same form class in year 9. Um, so you just put a 12 in front. And so, you know, we're doing all this stuff. We don't have a lot of time to learn. So we've got to make it easy and demystify it. I heard a, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I heard a really interesting anecdote mm. the other day about a woman trying to collect emails for organising a kid's birthday party and she asked three of the dads <laughs> for their emails and they automatically gave her oh the wife's goodness. email. Oh, yeah. And it's mm. just... Mm. Uh, you can't do everything, it's so hard. Mm. Mm. And so, you know, what you said before about sometimes we're having conversations mm. up here mm. and people need mm. us to be tailoring things more to what's actually mm. happening in mm. their life. You know, as industry, you know, we can take for granted how much we know, we can take for granted how educated mm. we are on these topics. Mm. So how do we take these conversations out of industry and into the real world and start making a difference, do you think? I think you. it's starting to... T I heard a really great quote the other day um, where someone said we need to start treating people like we'd like to be treated ourselves and the person said actually we need to start treating people as they want to be treated mm. and so we've got to start giving people information that they get that they understand in ways um, and you look at some of the prescribed wording we have for things like PDSs. Mm -hmm. Do we all even get it ourselves? Like, mm -hmm. So we've got to take some of the stuff and make it digestible and make it understandable and make it relatable. And one thing we found is actually having people involved writing stuff who are not industry experts. And we had some people saying, oh my goodness, this person isn't actually a financial expert. I said, that's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Now, Hugh, you're also a member of the FSC board. Um, so tell me a little bit, what is the FSC working on at the moment? OK, well, um, look, I think, uh, I mean, one, one is sort of obviously is right here, right now. And I, I think you know, I, what I would like to just um, sort of pull out of this really is that this was an initiative driven from members of the FSC. You know, we're not talking about a top-down, we must, as an organisation, do this because it's part of our strategy. This was a need and a problem that um, I suppose the team came together over a glass of wine and came up with this highly valuable output. And uh, and I suppose, you know, the, so one thing that the FSC is doing is, is actually breeding a community of leaders. Um, and many of you in the room are involved in working groups uh, in the board or in uh, different fora uh, across the FSC. I'd encourage everyone who isn't involved, if you're part of a member organisation, to find a way of contributing to the FSC because this is the kind of stuff that comes out of that contribution. You know, I look around the, w the room, there are just so many people um, providing just that, that little bit. Uh, if you have 10 minutes spare in your week, then maybe one minute can go to the FSC. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, th this is one thing the FSC is doing, is building a community and, um, and letting these great ideas flow through and then sponsoring them, finding the right sponsors, connecting the grassroots ideas with, um, the, I suppose, the, the shareholders, mm. uh, but the senior management of the different member organisations. And, and we get this great collaboration going. So, so I think, you know, let's look around the room and just see what's happening here. One initiative I would pull out, which I think is highly valuable in this context, is the data working group. Um, and the FSC has been looking at how to collect together information um, from the member organisations and from the industry and then find ways to use that to drive behavioural output from the member organisations but also from the public as well. And I think many of the things that people have talked about on the panel 
um, I suppose Sarah's you know, point that it needs to be, our actions need to be customised and relevant for each individual. Well, we're in a world where that's actually now possible. You know, we, we shouldn't be creating a product for women. We should be creating a product, you know, for Donna or for Ivy or, you know, it, it's, it's a solution, it's mass customization. And, uh, and this is completely possible and, you know, we can't do it in every context, but we should be able to do that uh, in the vast majority of cases. So I would say, um, you know, let's, let's support that FSC data initiative. Um, it's going to be take a bit of time to get the best data in, and then we have to get the brightest minds and the best ideas to use that data to then drive outcomes. Um, you know, the world's too complicated to sort of do it without data now. So mass customization using data um, would be the, the way. One other um, use of this data, if I may say one other thing, and, and maybe this is a kind of a, uh, um, you know, a couple of these things to help. Um, I suppose from a male context, we probably need to do a couple of things that sort of, you know, the, the, this is something that looked attractive to me anyway, <laughs> and that is, let's make this competitive. Um, you know, funds managers love talking about uh, their financial or their, their fund performance. Well, that's kind of old hat now, right? We all know, as you know, and some of you will admit to me that, you know, all of that active management stuff, um, you know, a lot of it's nonsense. <laughs> and, uh, and, so, uh, and so comparing your benchmark performance with my benchmark performance, you're in a growth fund, and over the long term, you're probably going to get a growth fund output, plus or minus a few basis points here and there that everyone will celebrate. Well, maybe we should be focusing a little bit more on member outcomes as the competitive um, spirit. You know, let's publish league tables of the best outcome for women. Let's publish outcomes of the best member education. Um, you know, Workplace Savings actually did a bit of that in the past. Mm. I think we can now take a more data-driven approach. Um, let's compete on the stuff that really actually matters, and I think the FSC is there to help support some of that um, data provision. That would be my idea. Absolutely. And you see ESG issues becoming more and more trendy with younger investors. Be cynical. Market to them on it. Why yeah. not? I mean, if that's what it takes to get things to change, exactly. do it. Um, now, this one's going to go, I'm going to go all along, um, and I'm going to start with you, Nick, so get your script ready. Um, <laughs> what is the one most impactful action that you think could be taken to help get a better retirement outcome for all New Zealanders? Ah... Uh. Um, I, th I think we need to look at KiwiSaver settings, don't we? And, and I mentioned KiwiSaver contribution rates while I'm, um, I was going to say mat leave, but I should say parental leave. Um, and that's a start, but there's possibly other things that can be done there. And I know um, listening to people speak earlier and before my session, there's other suggestions around you know, contributions when people aren't working for other reasons. Um, that would be my one big thing. Oh, and talking about the issue um, and, you know, what a great initiative. Um, well done to everyone who's been involved. Absolutely, yeah. So shining a light on the problems mm. is really important. Christina, how about you? Yeah, there are so many um, sh measures. Um, I would say knowledge is power. So whether that's improving transparency when it comes to gender pay gap, but also when it comes to investing, um, providing all participants in KiwiSaver or providing information on why they should be part of KiwiSaver and the implications of the choices that they make to level that playing field, I feel would go some way towards addressing the gender um, retirement gap. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sarah, go for it. Um, oh, I will. <laughs> you might regret saying that, Francis. Um, look, I think there is no one solution. It's really hard to pull out one thing. Um, I think if we think about this as an industry body, and what can we do collaboratively? So I think there's a bunch of things that are really important, but I think we have to do more than just expect women to kind of go off and do it themselves, even though that and education is a really important part of it. We've got to do more, and um, Minister Tanetti, I think, has gone, but it's good to hear about financial literacy in schools, and that's important, but we've got to do more than just expecting schools to miraculously solve it, because I've got kids at school, what I see is 
they've got a fairly full book at the moment. Um, we've also got to do more than just expecting companies voluntarily to do the right thing, even though we should all be doing that. I'm really proud to work for an organisation that globally has a gender pay gap of less than 1%. Mm -hmm. um, We've also just created a new role, contract signed yesterday, and we will be hiring a gender consulting expert, equity expert, to come and work with our clients and companies to go, how do I actually fix this pay gap? And then how do I help with that financial wellness? So companies can certainly be doing things, but I think the best thing industry organisations like this can do is is lobbying to go, how do we get sensible policy changes? And I think the most important thing is fixing the gender pay gap. So I think if we can be lobbying, it's great to hear Minister Tanetti talk about the transparency work that's happening, but that is one of the most systemic ones and it needs a fix beyond just individuals. So I think that and really sensible policy settings that we're involved in about how we keep those contributions going when women are busy off caring for everyone else except themselves. Mm, yeah. Very mm. true. Mm. Dr Pushpa, your mm. thoughts? <laughs> okay. <coughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Yourselves in for <laughs> One thing is I, I am a great subscriber of um, Jane's um, language of demystify money. Let's stop talking about financial capability and literacy and well-being and all of that. Let's, let's say it what it is, and that's about money, right? And that's about how do I actually protect my future in later years, right? Because Retirement means different things to different culture. In, in my culture, it means I will no longer be working for money, but now I will have a role with my grandchildren, my community, my same as in Pacific communities. So I'm still working, but I'm not working for money. Right? So let's, let's talk about, let's change the discourse a little bit and say we're talking about money. The conversation about money needs to start at home first, then it needs to be brought into school, then it needs to go into university and in workplace and in continuation of that. I've heard the terms knowledge and education so many times so far, yet education sector doesn't seem to be part and parcel of your conversations. And, and involved in your roundtable discussions as an as a industry. Are you involving education sector at all levels in your conversations to see what can be done, right? And the one impactful thing as an industry you can do is if I come back in two years' time, you should be able to say, as part of our awareness campaign, we managed to bridge this gap by 2%, we managed to do this by 5%, we managed to increase this by 2% or whatever. Otherwise, it's a feel-good event, fantastic, food is good, the location is good, venue is good, conversation is good, but so what? <laughs> right? So what? Now that in 12 weeks you made people aware, right? You, that was your campaign was all about. You made them aware, so what? What are you expecting from this awareness? What, are you, what is the one thing each one of you expecting from this awareness campaign? If you can take that away, I will be a very happy woman. <laughs> Fabulous. All right, Hugh, last up, no pressure. Sorry, what? Hugh, if I yeah. pose challenge to FSC for that no, one. No, you just didn't <laughs> say that the speakers were really good as well, oh, so I just had to... <laughs> I, left, I left that for you. <laughs> Uh, look, uh, I think you know, one thing maybe we haven't covered as much as uh, some of the other parts of the, the challenge is participation. Um, so we've talked a lot about the gender pay gap, which of course flows into contribution rates. But I think being in a scheme is, is the first step. And um, the UK actually has made some good steps around this in 2012, um, introducing uh, um, some compulsion uh, to go into a scheme um, uh, in the private sector anyway, and I think it was within just two or three years they closed the participation gap, which had been sitting at something about 3 
uh, percentage points difference between men and women. And of course, you know, looking at that compulsion and compulsion settings, so uh, um, completely fix that within a few years. So I think you know, we, if we were to do one thing, maybe from a policy perspective, it would be to form a really strong view <coughs> on how do we get 100% participation of women we can talk about contributions after that, but you have to actually be in the scheme somewhere. Um, so that, that's my one thing. Let's get 100% uh, of women involved in a savings scheme somehow, and it won't be one solution, it will be a multiple, yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for your time, your insights, your passion. And if, I think, frankly, if we had more people getting frustrated and angry about this issue, it would be much better. So thank you very much, all of you, for your knowledge and for sharing them with us. Really appreciate it. Huge round of applause, please, for our speakers. Thank you, Francis. Great discussion. So some key points that resonated with me, and I'm pretty good at bringing these things together. So Christina, the transparency, and I have to say over the last maybe 12 months, 18 months, I think that's lifting a public awareness and a profile about it, but we've still got a lot more to do, so thank you for calling that out. Dr Pushpa, I wrote a book while you chatted, but the things I picked out were you talked about a financial resilience index across staff, and then um, doing some, uh, you know, identifying the gaps, and then building a strategy around that, so that's resonating with me. Hugh, you talked about sharing the success stories, because you're right, there is, has been a journey and there have been some successes, not enough, but I think that's a really good way of looking at it. Nick, acknowledging that it's a community, it's a collaborative, it's a family, it's no matter what gender, it's everyone's discussion. And uh, Sarah, listening to the conversation that um, your friend or colleague is now having with Joel, so Joel's, um, I think, probably feeling a little cornered, but thank you for the work that Mercer have done on that and I think the last thing that you said was there's more to be done and it felt like you were talking about a marathon where you see someone sees the finish line and they just really can't make it but they can do it because we all help them get across the line. So thank you panellists, great discussion, really enjoyed the, um, the tips and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you.